call the, the talk 3 to 1, a classroom for everyone. And uh, you'll see what I mean by the 3 to 1. Um, in a way, I don't want to spend time, in fact, I didn't want to spend time on the very early days of dogma. I didn't particularly want to go back into the film movement. I wasn't for once going to mention or, or display the article that Scott wrote uh, in 2000, although I will refer to it, obviously. Um, I, so I wasn't going to talk about that stuff, and now I don't have to, because Jeremy has. Where's Jeremy? Is he gone? He's there. <laughs> oh, you're in the same seat. <laughs> Very good. Um, what, what I do want to do is certainly defend the three core tenets of teaching unplugged. It wouldn't be much fun if I didn't engage with Jeremy's critique of all three of those. Um, I think it's worth pointing out, I don't think they're described as pillars in the book. You, I may be wrong. I don't think we've ever talked about them as pillars. And in a way, I'm quite happy to think of them as tent poles. Because I think a tent is quite a handy thing, and actually not a bad analogy, as if we needed yet another analogy. I mean, a tent is flexible, and it's portable, and it can be moved and shaped into one environment or another. So it's actually not a bad analogy for an unplugged approach. So I will be defending those three core pillars, tenets, tent poles. Um, and I want to look at other aspects of dogma, too. I want to engage, if I can, with the idea that dogma is just good teaching, because it's a criticism that's been levelled at dogma before. And I, I think it goes deeper than that. And I think the implications of teaching unplugged and the potentiality in teaching unplugged for teachers and learners goes beyond just good teaching. And I want to look at those other aspects of dogma, not just from my own perspective or by quoting from our book or from, um, from things that we've written before, but especially through the eyes and in the words of other educators. And it's, it seems to me there's a whole new generation, maybe two new generations of educators who've started to adopt and engage with dogma. And, you know, Cheer is someone who's been writing and speaking about dogma for a long time now. Um, Alistair, I know, gave a talk yesterday, which I was only able to follow on Twitter. Um, but ev even on Twitter, it was, it was very enjoyable and engaging. And, you know, there'll be moments where I quote from people talking on blogs, uh, people who've commented on articles that I've posted online, and here and there from conversations, from some private correspondence. So I've, I've tried to kind of put together all sorts of different perspectives um, to hopefully support our case for, for teaching unplugged. Uh, for all my faith in spontaneity in the classroom, I tend to turn to little rubrics when I'm talking. So one, two, three, or three, two, one is one of them. Uh, and I also, as I started to plan this, I did plan it, uh, started to think about who, what, where, when. And of course, it was only when I went back to Jeremy's abstract a couple of days ago that I realized that he'd used those same words. So if imitation is the sincerest form of flattery, um, and in the spirit of echoing and recasting, <coughs> then, uh, then I'll proceed. When dogma started in 2000, uh, not ELT, uh, but dogma, uh, looking back on it now, I see it as starting as a critique, uh, and a critique of weak form communicative language teaching. Um, if the question had been, what's happened to the communicative approach, which was a question that some of us were asking without necessarily being able to articulate it, then Scott's first article and the first conversations that we had about dogma, I think, were a way of starting to answer that. And my question now would be, why might we need to consider an alternative to weak form communicative language teaching? I would suggest the kind of communicative language teaching that's expressed in many modern course books. I think there are three reasons to do this. And one of them is, is that kind of perennial challenge for teachers of motivation and relevance. And while we did see that wonderful Iranian teacher finding a way into the text, which I'm sure is something that we talk about in the book as a perfectly valid way of working with course books. There are sections at the back of the book where we engage with several of these uh, 
sort of hot potatoes, if you like, around dogma, and using course books is one of them. Um, th the fact remains that, and, and I'm sure you know this as teachers, uh, you may know it as having learned other languages as well, that sometimes course books and the way they're used, because I don't think all teachers do good teaching necessarily. I don't think all teachers do learn over time to adapt um, and to use material in a very personalized way. Uh, we've, we've all found ourselves teaching stuff that's boring. Um, and we've all found ourselves bored while teaching it. And as you will remember from school, you can't hide it if you're bored as a teacher. Your students will know that within seconds if the stuff that you're using isn't fully engaging you. And so I think motivation and relevance are really important. And I'll, I'll post all these references after the talk, and possibly not today, but tomorrow, both on my own uh, blog, which I'll give you the address to, and on the IH site as well. Um, and the first of these is from uh, a guy called Rob Haynes, who some of you will recognize his name from the dogma list. And uh, he works in the States and is a very committed dogma teacher. And he posted quite recently, at the end of last year, what he described as an edited summary of comments made by the students I work with who've used course books most of their lives and have been learning unplugged for the past four months. And here are just a couple of the comments that those students made. So this is learner feedback. The first is, the book doesn't know what topics I like, but you, the people in the room, can ask me. Every day is different. Following a course book is too rigid. Doesn't mean necessarily that every teacher who uses a course book uses it rigidly. I completely accept that. And I've seen teachers teaching brilliantly from course books, as we all have. But there's that potential, certainly, in using a course book, in using one that may not be as engaging as it might be through a lot of its content for it to be rigid. But this is learner language. This is what they're saying. Um, the course book isn't as good as your immediate feedback, which I think is interesting. So it's introducing this idea of a dynamic between what's happening in the room, what the people are saying, and what the teacher, and indeed the other learners, are able to feed back. And the last point, which is, is relevant also to some of the thoughts I'm going to return to later, is that Grammar exercises are usually easy to figure out. This is the learner talking here. Grammar exercises are usually easy to figure out in the course book, which is not like actually using English. I think it's a really strong point, um, this idea that once you work out the first two or three answers in a grammar exercise of 10 or 20 questions, you can work out the others, and it becomes possibly beneficial rote learning and repetition, or it possibly becomes unmotivating and rather mindless. Um, I don't know how many of you have looked at copies of English grammar in use uh, in students' ha homes. Very often you'll find that only the first couple of units have been completed when people have bought this, this book um, for self-study. And I think it's partly because of this process of actually they just figure it out. They realize that once they've got the first couple of answers right, they can kind of get the others right if they really want to. And, and I often think that the fortune of that book is based on the same premise as Coleman's mustard. The idea being that Coleman's made their money from the mustard that's left on the plate after you slap on too much. You don't actually use that much. Um, and this idea that the grammar exercises are usually easy to figure out, which is not like actually using English supports my view that English grammar in use should be called English grammar out of use. Um, because it's separating out all these bits and pieces. And I'll try and engage with, with Jeremy's very complex <coughs> analogy and critique uh, relating to music and how we learn music. Uh, possibly not now, possibly later when, when we discuss it uh, in, the, in the panel. So I think motivation and relevance are important. I think also that the way we experience now is important. I mean, the way that people encounter English across the world, both in and out of school, has changed enormously. It's changed a lot in my teaching lifetime, which started in the um, late 1980s. So a while ago, but not that long ago, and even between around 1987 and 1997, 1998, by which time I found myself 
managing or trying to manage a small language school in London. The intake had changed, and this was a multinational intake, as you'll know, those of you taught in London, um, which I think allows us to rely on it as evidence of changes all over the world. Um, the, the intake had changed, and we had far fewer learners coming into the school as complete beginners. In fact, it was very difficult to set up a beginner's class um, using, using the, the salary structures uh, and, the, and, the, the, and the payment structure that we'd established at the school. It, was, it actually wasn't viable to have a beginner's class, and we often had to turn the few absolute beginners who came through our doors away. I'm not suggesting for a moment that there are no absolute beginners in the world, but that change was evidence of broader trends in English language education and English language experience worldwide, because these were people coming from all over the world. And I summarise this in the introduction to Teaching Unplugged. I will quote from it once um, by saying this. Our students were coming to us with their English, not coming to us for English. They belonged to a world in which English was being used and taught more widely than ever before. They were and I'm quoting here from a book by David Gradle that he wrote for the British Council, they were David Gradle's new generation for whom English was simply there in one form or another in the world. What they wanted was to engage with it. And our first courses were conversation-based and used no course book. Bring your English, we said, and we'll work on it together. So that's the second of my answers to the why question. Why do we need that critique of weak form communicative language teaching? Things are changing and they're constantly changing and we can expect that trend to increase because governments are investing more and more in primary level education in English, secondary level and so on. And there's the influence of business and the internet and so on. And there's finally a, a, a more complex question, I think, um, which is how we learn a language. Do we, as second language learners, learn in a linear way, which is the way that course books suppose or propose that we do, or do we actually learn in a way that is sort of a kind of bricolage as we try and connect what we've already been taught before with what we're experiencing now? And the challenge then becomes, I would see it as, and I'll come back to this, helping learners to put together all the bits of language that they've already learnt or been exposed to or experienced. Um, this is where my reference becomes less than academic. It's a reference to a pub conversation. Um, and it was a conversation that we had on Wednesday night. And this is a conversation with a guy called Dale Coulter, who some of you might have heard reference, I think, yesterday in Alistair's talk. And um, I was with Dale and, and Cheer and a couple of other friends. And Dale is someone who, you know, in our little world, famously, took up Teaching Unplugged uh, right at the end of his CELTA and took it into his first teaching job. Uh, and he has a great blog. Uh, I'll give you the reference, as I say, online later. And, you know, he is always thinking about teaching. He's always learning about it and sharing that learning. Uh, and he described a conversation that he had with a one-to-one -one student in Rome, an Italian guy. Uh, this student got a free course book when he paid for his course. I think he got two free course books, actually. Um, and what's interesting about this student is that he has a master's in educational psychology. So he was bringing kind of two hats, if you like, to the process of, of, of looking at and potentially using this course book. One was as a language learner, and one was as a, an observer and, and expert in language. Um, and he, he took a good look at the course book, Dale told us. He kind of cast a critical eye over it, and he looked at the units, and he looked at the themes of the units, and he looked at the grammar syllabus, and he said words to this effect. This, is a, this book represents a linear grammar syllabus disguised as a, th as a series of thematic units, which I think is a lovely quote. Um, it's a linear grammar syllabus disguised as a series of thematic units. That's not how the brain works. Now, you know, I'm not sure we know how the brain works when it comes to second language acquisition. I'm still very much starting out in terms of trying to you know, increase my theoretical knowledge, if you like, 
And what fascinates me reading about second language acquisition is almost how little we know about it. Um, which is not to say that one theory is as good as any other, but I think certainly the idea that we don't learn second languages as adults in a linear way is a valid argument, and it's one that's worthy of further exploration. So those are my three suggestions for the reasons why we might need to consider an alternative to weak form communicative language teaching. Uh, is there an alternative, and how would it work? It'll be no surprise to you that I'm going to now suggest that dogma, or teaching unplugged, is an alternative. 2000 was when Scott wrote the article that Jeremy <coughs> described to us earlier, and that's when a kind of long conversation about dogma began. It started out as a discussion group, and then it gradually moved into teacher training environments and classrooms, very much driven by Scott in the early days. And, and recently, it's, it kind of exploded onto blogs uh, and social networking sites that teachers use, and so on. Um, so if I look back at 2000, and I see a critique of the communicative language approach or in its weak form, what had kind of become of it, um, what I see by the time we get to 2009, again, as Jeremy suggested in our book, Teaching Unplugged, is an attempt to kind of codify that, to make it usable, to make it practical, to demystify it, because I think dogma has been the victim of a kind of mystification, sometimes from its its supporters, um, and what we came up with was a, a, this sort of three-pillar, if you like, although we haven't called them pillars, framework, uh, which we felt would be useful for teachers, either in terms of thinking about what they might do in class and trying to align it with an unplugged approach, or in terms of comparing what they already did in class with what we were suggesting was a valid framework for teaching. Um, and as Jeremy said, um, the, the three principles that we came up with were the idea that lessons should be conversation-driven, that they should be materials light, and that they should be focused on emergent language. I, th I mean, we chose those terms really carefully, and I'm glad we did, because I do think they stand up partly because, and I'm not tall enough to point, partly because they don't actually set boundaries they just suggest a useful framework. So in saying that classes should be conversation-driven, we're not saying that they should be bound by conversation, that that's the only thing that can happen. And in fact, the more I train and, and teach, the more I think about it, the more I think that interaction-driven would be as useful, perhaps, in terms of how dogma evolves and of the role of little bits of writing in helping conversation along which is one of the ways that we can address Jeremy's valid question about different learning styles and different personality styles. Yeah, so it's not just a question of saying, okay, let's talk, let's talk. And of course you get the loudest, most confident people talking first. Uh, and unless you're very skillful, you might under-deliver in terms of including everyone. Um, if you allow people a bit of processing time by suggesting they write down an answer to a question, then that's starting to account for those different personality types. You're giving everyone a chance to think about it, maybe to share with you what they've written down as a first sort of gambit in a conversation. So you can have a look at it, and then everyone's kind of starting from the same place. So we're not bound by conversation, and, and we didn't say materials free, um, and we didn't specify what kind of materials should be light. So there are ways of using a course book lightly. There are ways of introducing material from outside the classroom that doesn't block either the time or the space that we have inside the class. So conversation driven, not conversation bound, materials light, not materials free, and focused on emergent language, but again, not confined to emergent language. And I think one of the important points to make is that dogma or unplugged lessons aren't a series of one-off experiences. Um, what happens in an unplugged lesson, I mean, if one imagines a first unplugged lesson, is that a process begins. Um, and it's a process that involves constantly drawing on the language and the experiences of the people in the room, considering, as a teacher, both on the spot in the class and between that class and the next, 
how one can best support what's happened, how one can move a thematic subject that's come up into another area, how one can vary task types, and how one can give people some pretty basic practice. So if something is emerged on one day, there's nothing in our framework approach to suggest that we can't do some grammar practice the next. There's nothing here that says we don't do little drills as we go along if a pronunciation problem emerges, or if there's an opportunity to just focus on a particular form. So these are principles, I think, really importantly, designed to ensure that there's enough space for interaction and to allow language that's relevant to the learners and which you can then feed back on in a way that's immediately relevant and compelling to emerge. And I've just noted three implications here. So I think these are important when it comes to applying this teaching in a principled way and also relevant when it comes to thinking about how we might train teachers differently, especially at a pre-service stage. If our lessons are conversation-driven, if that's going to mean anything, then we need to be flexible in our timings. We can't be bound by minute lesson phases in a lesson plan because we're either going to be nervous of leaving the lesson plan or we're, going to, or, or we're going to find that there's no time for conversation or one or the other or both. So timings have to be flexible. When we talk about using materials in a light way, the key here is that we're using materials in a bottom-up way, not a top-down way. Um, so if students are bringing stuff to class, I would suggest even if a teacher is bringing something to class, there's a degree of personal agency which isn't there if we're simply always and only using a course book which has been planned by someone else, possibly for different people, for a different market. Course books don't always get used in the places they were supposed to be used. Um, and then thirdly, if we're focusing on emergent language, and I think this is possibly the biggest challenge of all, and I think this is where it gets really interesting, um, we can't rely on language exponents. And we need to do a lot of our planning work after the class has happened. So I used to call this post-planning. Um, this was in the days before dogma as a term was invented. Um, so the idea being that we might save a bit of time before the class. We might not need to join the queue for the photocopier or end up kicking it when it doesn't work. Um, we might not be looking for stuff in resource books to supplement the weaknesses in a course book. Um, but we don't get away with it. We don't get away with not planning stuff because we use whatever time we might have used before a class after it to examine it and to reflect. And I think, to use Donald Schoen's terms, we need to think about reflection in action as unplugged teachers, reacting to stuff on the spot. What can I do with this? As Jeremy said, this is something that good teachers always do. But also reflecting after action, reflecting on action is his term. <coughs> Um, the idea that we spend time and think about what's happened and then we feed it into the next class. So it's a, it is a profoundly reflective process. It's the very opposite of, of just kind of flying by the seat of your pants or winging it. If the teaching is done in a principled way, it requires a lot of thought and a lot of attention. So I believe this does, as a framework approach, represent an alternative. When is it practicable? Is it practicable in all teaching environments? Uh, is it practicable in all contexts? I think it needs to be adapted, which is why, actually, I think the notion that these are tent poles rather than pillars is a, is a nice one. I might take that, Jeremy, um, because you know, it means that we can adapt this approach to whatever teaching context we find ourselves in, rather than trying to do what would be crazy and adapt the teaching context or the content of a course, if we're talking about an exam-based course or a CLIL course, to the approach. The approach needs to be flexible. So when can we use it? I suggest we can use it whenever people bring some language to school, some English, <laughs> I mean. Um, people often ask whether dogma can be taught with complete beginners. I think it's more of a challenge. I think the scaffolding, the nature of the support we give our learners changes. And I think the role for rote learning and memorization is probably greater than it is at higher levels. But I certainly think it can be done because the principle is to build on what people bring to class. Whatever we can take 
we start building words into phrases, phrases into structures. I think we can use this approach when people are demotivated, because as Rob's feedback would suggest, it can be, it can be empowering. I don't think that's a bad word to use. When I think partly when students who've always been taught with a course book for years and years and who haven't had a chance to communicate as much as they would have liked in class suddenly get the chance to do that. It can be empowering. It can be, it can be maybe moving is over-egging the pudding. Um, but it can be exciting to see people's faces light up as they realise that suddenly in this classroom context, which is not the only one and which is not necessarily superior to the others. I think it represents a valid alternative, Jeremy, is, is what I'd suggest if, if, if I take that on board or, or take that on, the idea of us thinking it's superior. I don't think we do think that. Um, I think we consider it to be a valid alternative um, and to be more or less valid depending on which of the criteria that I've been outlining um, are, are sort of foremost. So I think we can use this when people are demotivated, giving people the chance to use that language, even if they've just got fragments of language and they're trying to put it together, can be really empowering. I mean, this was the idea behind communicative language teaching. Strong form communicative language teaching is based on the idea that we learn language by using it. You know, this whole language idea of Frank Smith's in the States that we learn to read by reading, I think can be extended in our context to the idea that we learn to speak by speaking, it's not the only way we learn to speak, and that's where the role of scaffolding and support from the teacher and all sorts of evolved teaching practices like memorization and drilling can come into play. And I think we can also use it when people are motivated, <laughs> um, perhaps when people are achieving considerable fluency in a language, perhaps when people, again, have been through a, a cycle of linear course books more than once in their life, possibly several times, um, and are at upper intermediate or advanced level. And again, using this approach there can mean that their vocabulary can be kind of, you know, can increase exponentially because you're building on what they've already got. You can be addressing problems with form and fluency <coughs> at any level, but particularly at these levels. Um, I, I'm sometimes skeptical of levels. Um, I'm a bit less skeptical now that I've started teaching again, <laughs> quite recently. Um, but I still would suggest that we sometimes divide levels too minutely. I think there's a huge difference between real beginners, between kind of true elementary learners who are encountering English for the first time. There's a real difference between them and a sort of wide band of intermediate learners who have various varying levels of fluency. But I don't know if you've ever taught, I'm sure you have, or observed classes at different levels um, on the same day or during the same week and found yourself teaching or watching someone else teach the same language points in an elementary class as you later encounter in an advanced class. Um, and sometimes accuracy really can be very variable across levels and in a way what we're trying to build is fluency. So that's when I think we can use teaching unplugged. Who can benefit from it? Okay, Two tricky words, um, synoptic learners and ectenic learners. Does anyone feel able to summarize those words? <laughs> You've been a braver man or woman than I. Okay, um, so let me quote from the place I uncovered this. It's called Key Terms in Second Language Acquisition, published by Continuum uh, a couple of years ago. And the authors are Van Patten and Bernati. But again, that'll be a reference I post online. Um, and this allows me to reference Jeremy's point about multiple intelligences and learning styles. Um, I often think that these ideas are kind of good for conferences, <laughs> good for papers, not so good for classrooms. Um, we need to take account of the fact that people have different personalities, that they have different preferred learning styles, that they have multiple intelligences. But when we encounter, bless you, a group of people who have an hour or a couple of hours to interact with one another, I think it's more about trying to build community, a, co a communal experience between those people as a teacher. I think that's part of our role. 
uh, than it is trying to kind of double guess at every stage what impact different tasks might have on different people. In short, I think we need to have a variety of task types in the classroom, and by doing that, we'll probably cover off quite a, lo quite a lot. So given my reservations, you can imagine how relieved I was to read this. Um, in Airman, so this is, I think, Jennifer Airman and Lever's 2003, I'll put it all online, concept of learning styles, learners basically come down to two types. Thank goodness. <laughs> Ectenic and synoptic. Uh, I'm going to read the references here because I often get them confused. Ectenic learners prefer or require conscious control over their learning, and synoptic learners leave more to unconscious processes. Um, to give a more concrete example of the difference, an ectenic learner might be the sort of learner who refers too frequently to a dictionary while doing a communicative task or even while speaking. Um, a synoptic learner at the extreme might be someone who refers to a dictionary too infrequently, who never checks what they're saying or what they're trying to say. Um, so, I mean, from a sort of common sense classroom point of view, that makes a lot of sense to me. Um, and someone, when I was speaking recently at the British Council, summarised it nicely after I'd been faffing around with synoptic and ectenic. He said, yes, it's fluency accuracy. And I said, yeah, I think it probably is. Um, but one reason I like this distinction, and this incidentally is the two of the three, two, <laughs> one. Um, this is the two after the three pillars. One of the reasons I like this distinction particularly, not just it's a relief that actually we can consider two basic kinds of learning style that encompass a wider variety, um, but also that I think this maps very nicely onto the dynamic of a dogma classroom, um, where we talk, and there is this emphasis on communication and interaction and conversation. But we also focus on what language the talk has produced. This is where the focus on emergent language comes in. And I sometimes describe this as a kind of play, pause, play scenario. Someone in a talk I gave earlier this year described it as a rolling dynamic, which I really liked. The rolling dynamic of, of, a, of, a, of an unplugged class. So the play part of it is the interaction, which is not unsupported, which might well start with a question that gives people some processing time and the chance to make a quick note, show it to the teacher, get settled, and then start talking. Um, I've just seen the camera, and I've completely lost my train of thought. Help. Someone's listening. <laughs> Where were we? Um, play, pause, play. Thank you. Thank you. OK. That was a pause. That was all scripted. Um, uh, so, yeah, that, that, that's the play. And then the pause is, OK, either or both, what interesting language has come up? What can we highlight here? What can we build on? This was great, what you said here. This, we can build on this. We can refine this. We can make it more accurate. We can improve fluency. Um, it may be that a particular form has emerged during the conversation which is causing problems or which would be very useful if people were to repeat the exercise. So there's a little bit of the task-based angle there. Um, I think we often in classes, sometimes encouraged by possibly actually sort of obliged by the linear grammar syllabus, um, we set the limits of conversation far too narrowly. So if we expect learners to have a conversation and actually we want them to produce a particular structure, um, A, it constricts conversation in a way that isn't natural, um, and B, it creates a kind of anxiety for everyone. There's the teaching anxiety of are they using that structure in this conversation? Why aren't they using the structure? And there's the learner anxiety of, oh, well, I've got to get the present perfect into this conversation somehow. And, and when you actually set conversation structures up where you don't have a language objective, you see, and, 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 and you can hear this in conversation between native and non-native speakers, that the range of forms, of verb forms, for example, is much wider than we might anticipate if we're trying to kind of get stuff into that course book grammar syllabus structure. So, in other words, and to, to kind of cut to the chase, I think that unplugged teaching can suit both of these kind of core learning styles because the interaction and the conversation 
will allow people who really want to communicate, who feel comfortable communicate, to do that, I think can be structured in a way that absolutely allows less communicative or less confident students to take part and to play an equal role. But if there are students who think, well, hold on a minute, I need to, you know, I can't just be talking all day here, then, um, do you want to take that? <laughs> then, um, then the pause in the conversation is going to reassure them because suddenly we're boarding stuff. We're saying, let's look at this together. Let's look at our notes. Let's work on this. Let's maybe drill a bit of pronunciation or let's create or bring in next day a grammar exercise that can help us nail a particular form. That's not a phrase I would have used um, if I'd planned it, but you know what I mean. Nail the form. Horrible. Okay. So that's the who. We've done the why, the how, the when, and the who. And where is my next question. <laughs> I think there was one more WH word uh, in the bank. Where can this kind of teaching be applied? Um, and this is where I suppose I get a bit more abstract. Because um, I think it can be applied in almost any teaching context, but you'll apply it differently depending on that context. And there are all kinds of factors that would influence the extent to which you unplug. Um, but I think this kind of teaching can operate in the space between learners and language. Um, because what's happening in the classroom is more organic, because the feedback is more immediate, it can actually engage learners more with almost the meta-language I mean, I've found that if you talk, <laughs> talk openly with even elementary classes about the kind of structures that might not be in their course book, they kind of come to life. You know, they know how to think. They know how conditionals work in their own language. It's not that they don't think these structures when they're having conversations about everyday stuff. And to talk to learners about this stuff, to introduce perhaps what we might think of as being higher level structures, into a, inverted commas, lower level class can bring people to life. And again, I'd like to quote from um, a blog now. This is a blog written by somebody called Kat, um, who teaches in Madrid. Um, and she describes what happened after or during an unplugged class, perhaps after the communicative part of it. She says, what followed, what, this is slightly out of context, but what followed was a series of riddles and correction sessions where the students were all much more involved than they normally were. They were inquisitive too. I think it's a really lovely sort of byproduct of teaching unplugged. The learners were inquisitive too. One student asked about indirect questions, so we did a few of those. Can you tell us if? Do you know if? Um, so the kind of focus on emergent language can be teacher directed. But given the, the kind of added engagement of getting immediate feedback on one's own language, it can also be learner-driven, which I think is when it gets really exciting. So that's one place where I think this kind of teaching can be implied, a uh, slightly abstract place, perhaps. Another is in the space between people and one another. And this is where, in the abstract, I suggested that having more conversation, allowing more space for organic interaction in classes can have a benefit that goes beyond language teaching or beyond the, the kind of language content is it can help to bring people together. It can help to kind of get that magic feeling of commonality in a class that we sometimes get happening more often. And there's another quote here from um, a teacher called Olga Kuskina who commented on a blog I wrote for the British Council. Um, and she writes... Uh, I mean, it's, it's going to sound like a bit of a plug, but um, she writes, I have watched your conference at the British Council online. So this was a talk in which I gave some sort of the basics, if you like, of teaching unplugged. And since then, since watching this online, I have tried to make some changes when I teach. I try to pay more attention to the language my students are interested in producing rather than, rather than the language they should produce in that unit. So again, it's not either or. She's obviously still using a course book, but she's just opening out her attention, if you like. She's increasing the, the potential for teaching teachable moments or learning affordances in the classroom. I try to pay more attention to the language my students are interested in producing 
rather than the language they should produce in that unit. And, she says, I have had amazing results. First of all, the relationship I have with my students turned more friendly, at which point, reading this comment, I beamed. Um, and also the relationship among them in the groups, at which point I chuckled. <laughs> I mean, I think that's a lovely summary of what can happen when there's more conversation, when there's more interaction. Not just that, but more space for that in classes. I'm just going to repeat that. First of all, the relationship I have with my students turned more friendly, and also the relationship among them in the groups. They are eager to speak, eager to ask what interests them, which, of course, motivates their learning. And, like you wrote, like you wrote, so I did write this, uh, there is always time to come back to the course book. Yep. So it's not either or, and I'm not suggesting this is the only way to achieve a happy classroom for a moment, but this is you know, direct feedback from someone who's just started to open that classroom space a bit more. And if you know, this framework approach has helped, then I think that gives it a certain validity. Uh, certainly not um, superiority, but I think a certain validity. And then finally, and this is really broadening things out, I think this kind of teaching can be applied in the space between individuals and society. Um, and I'm going to quote from, uh, quote from private correspondence, uh, an email exchange between myself uh, and someone called Shelley Terrell, who's, who knows or has heard of Shelley, or she's very, very active online um, and, and is, is very active in uh, promoting the use of Web 2.0 and interactivity and online tools. Um, but she's also profoundly concerned with what happens in schools to people, to young people, when their voice isn't listened to, when their voice isn't heard. Uh, and she asked me a question uh, in, in, in the, at the start of this email exchange. She said, do you think dogma could be applied to other subjects? Uh, and I said that I thought it could. I needed to, to think about it and increase my theoretical base before suggesting or outlining how I thought it could happen. But in my mind, the same principle of listening to people, asking them about their concerns, and working bottom-up, almost spiralling out of the immediate context. Perhaps this is where local can start to make sense, Jeremy. Um, if we start with what's immediate to us on the day, and we move out from there, then pretty soon we're going to encompass all sorts of other things. It's impossible to have a conversation. If we were to have, if this was, a, I don't know, a geography class, if they still have such classes in UK schools. Um, and we wanted to start with the immediate environment, then we could start by thinking about how this room was constructed, rather than by going to a coal mine somewhere a very long way away. We could start with something to do with the immediate physical world. But, you know, you can't go from your immediate physical world very far without encountering other physical worlds. It reminds me of the wonderful sermon, a uh, Christmas sermon for peace that Martin Luther King wrote in about 1967, delivered towards the end of his life, um, where he describes what happens when we eat breakfast. He, he, he invites us to consider where our breakfast has come from. And he says, pretty soon, if you imagine the breakfast you're having, there's a West African pouring your coffee and the orange juice has been produced by someone for you in the Caribbean. And he mentions all these different people in different parts of the world who are actually kind of, you know, putting your breakfast together for you. But the idea is that if you start with what's immediate, pretty quickly you get beyond the local. In other words, we're not bound by our immediate experience or concerns on a day. Our minds are never bound. You know, our minds are full of hopes and dreams and wishes and regrets. And that's actually part of the dynamic of language which we can either constrain by asking people to only focus on one area or one time frame, or allow, and then start to look at the relationship between different forms and how they help us to express what we want to say. So how can this kind of teaching help in the space or, or to narrow the space between individuals and society? I just want to quote, with Shelley's permission, from a, a, a reply that she sent to me and she asks, my question is, how do we begin? She's now thinking, she was, I think, referring to the American school system. So she's going beyond DLT. And we, we, we're just wondering what the implications, what the potential is. 
for using this kind of teaching in other environments. And she asks, my question is, how do we begin to develop this learning within our learners? Right now in schools, the traditional approach and standardised testing, etc., are making learners disgusted with education because education is routine, drilled, facts, and very uninteresting. They don't see the connection because they are being told versus taking part in a conversation. There are millions who are lost because they aren't allowed to communicate. When we don't give learners a voice and we don't teach them to communicate their knowledge and make the connection, then students don't translate it well into their lives. They grow up in poverty, get into drugs, or caught up in crime, trying to find a way to be heard and understand. There are too many children and adults who exist in these systems, and I believe educators can begin to guide learners into their own definition of self and voice. Um, if that's suddenly going too broad, too abstract for you, let's bring it back to the language classroom, because I promised to do a 3 two, one um, and we've done the three tent poles. I'm having that, Jeremy. Um, we've done those two kinds of learner who are catered for in the kind of play, pause, talk, reflect, rolling dynamic of an unplugged classroom. And this is all kind of moving to, I guess, the idea of togetherness, of commonality, of trying to reduce distance, either between teacher and learners, learner and subject, potentially learners and society. And so my final thought is that ideally this kind of teaching can promote togetherness. And Scott and myself did a, an interview recently for the Learner Autonomy Special Interest Group newsletter, I think it was. Um, and one of their questions was, do you think that dogma is compatible with the learning autonomy movement? Um, and our reply, Scott's reply in this case, was yes to a certain extent, but we see this very much as being a shared experience between the teacher and the student. And reflecting on this further, I think that teaching unplugged isn't just about learner autonomy. It's not just about empowering the learner, but it's about learning autonomy. And it's about the people in the room kind of operating independently, operating creatively. And yes, you can be creative with published materials. And yes, you can build independence into one's use of course books like Simon's. Um, I'm not saying for a minute, whoops, that was nearly a judgment. Um, I'm not saying for a minute that you can't do that. Um, but I think for a, you know, look around us, look at, look at the, the, the movements, whether it's against capitalism or against autocracy in the Middle East. You know, it's a questioning world. It's a world whose structures, whose future, when you think about the environment and so on, is being questioned. And we need to promote a communicative <laughs> approach in our schools, a truly communicative approach, not just for subject content reasons, but for social reasons as well. I'm going to need to refer to my notes, because the word together actually came from another comment. And this was from a... This is why I can't get rid of this. Um, OK. Let's go to here. This is where I bring up a letter to my sister or something. Um, please, God. Um, here we go. All right. So this was a comment from... Uh, an, uh, an, uh, teacher trainer called Gemma Gardner, who some of you might have again come across on social networking sites or on blogs. She works with Anthony Gorn in Barcelona, um, Barcelona. Not, not everything happens there, in Hamburg. Um, and Ant Anthony's the, the, the guy who unplugged his teacher training course um, with a, a colleague called Izzy Ord initially, and now works with Gemma. And commenting on the same blog post that encouraged Olga to talk about the way that her students were getting on better with each other in groups, as well as improving the relationship between herself and the students. Gemma wrote this, and it's a long quote, and, and you can actually read it for yourselves if you're at the front of the room, but for those of you at the back, I'll read it out. It's just a way of bringing what I've just sort of expanded out into potential worlds of education systems back to what we do in the English language classroom. Uh, and she says something that resonated strongly with me. I know that even though I'm a believer in the unplugged teaching attitude, when I'm feeling uninspired, 
or tired or unmotivated, I reach for a book. You know, she has done that, <laughs> looking at the expression on your face. I don't know if Alistair's done that. I've certainly done that. Um, luckily, before I go into class with a stack of paper, I usually come to my senses and realize that nothing in the book does half of what I or my learners want or need or can be interested in. And I like this idea that you can interest people. And I do want to pick up one last point, Jeremy, about boring students. I've never had a boring student. It's sometimes taken me a long time to, to, to gel or to find that kind of point of interest. But again, conversation can be a way of getting there. If we don't keep talking, if we don't keep listening, don't keep asking questions, we're never going to get to the heart of that individual and find perhaps that one little spark that allows you to think, OK, they're not a rather dull individual. Yeah, they might look that way, but they've got this whole interest that I didn't even know about. They've got a passion that I wasn't aware of, and now we can start to use that as something to talk about in class. So I usually come to my senses and realise that nothing in the book does half of what I or my learners want or need or can be interested in. If I do get to the point of photocopying something and taking it in, it either gets left on the side whilst the conversation draws the lesson in a different direction, or it is, at best, hardly touched. This is the true wonder of being prepared to go unplugged. I can feel at my lowest, desperately in need of tea or worse. What could be worse than tea? Does she mean coffee? Um, but when I go into class, the people in there enliven me. And I'm sure this is an experience that we've all had. It's one of the reasons that we teach or teach to train. It's one of the reasons why we work with people. Yeah, is this happens. We can be in the throes of life crises. And then we get in the classroom and suddenly there are other people. Something happens and it takes us out of ourselves. So the genuine interest, the conversation and the interaction are what I love about this world of teaching. And since pulling the plug... Um, which doesn't mean pulling the plug on technology. It is an analogy, and it's to do with being independent from or more independent from pre-planned lessons. Um, I've become so much more amazed at the fantastic world we live in because I have more of a chance to learn about it through talking to the people in the room. And I think by analogy, that's an experience that we can expect learners in that environment to have also. So it's about engaging not just with language but with life. This is far from laziness, I would argue. This is a reference back to something in the thread earlier. It takes guts to begin with, if you're used to a course book. Um, and the thought of it can still be daunting when you're feeling, as I described earlier. But I always, without fail nowadays, find it's the best way to ensure that I leave the classroom at the end of the 90 minutes feeling like we got somewhere and achieved something together. And that last word is important. And I agree. And that's my one together. Uh, we'll have a chance to discuss these issues later at the panel discussion. But thanks again, Jeremy and Sean. And that's the end of my talk. Thank you.